So today, uh, when you opened the news in the morning, you could see the big titles, how the elections that happened yesterday and the day before uh, finally uh, happened, what were the results. So again, in Czech Republic, we went through this ritual of uh, regular elections. So people went to vote. And uh, when we will talk about parallel police, I think it's interesting to stop at this point, because Czech meaning of the term to vote means hlasovat, uh, or dad hlas, to give a vote, uh, has very interesting etymology. Because when you strictly translate the term hlas, it's not a vote, it's a voice. So when you, when you vote in Czech, it means you give a voice. When you give a voice, you give up your own voice, you hand it over to someone else, and he got the voice, and he can tell you, shut up, I have the voice now. So what we are going to talk about is different way, uh, different attitude you can take other than giving up your voice, not to give up your voice, not to vote uh, for, usually we say, smaller evil, but uh, there is possibly another, another way. Um, but we are here to talk about the concept parapolis and where it comes from. And uh, I have to say a little story behind. Most of you probably heard about it, but for those who didn't, this space was originally inspired by a Slovak hackerspace progress bar. And Progress Bar uh, was a little bit different hackerspace than others because it was not primarily a um, uh, geek club where you just bustled and, and worked with, with technologies and so on, but they were very much focused on um, lectures and education and uh, gatherings, which we liked a lot, that they didn't only close up to, to small community, but they also promoted. They also promoted uh, some new technologies, crypto technologies, and so on. So we wanted to have something similar in, Pla in Prague. And we were searching for a format, a space, some venue for it, and, and of course, a name. And when we have found this house, we realized that we can be something more, something wider than just a hacker space. It can create a space that will serve to public to, uh, to get simply knowledge, ideas, inspiration, whatever, whatever else. And then I, uh, one evening, uh, when we were setting up this, this premise and we were uh, preparing the first Hackers' Congress six, six years ago, we, uh, I talked to my friend who studied political sciences. And I was describing him what we aim to do here. I, I, I taught him about Bitcoin and liberating uh, technologies and, and encryption and creating some unique, special and separate sphere of relationships beside the uh, beside, uh, state and official one. And he told me, the, the thing you are calling, uh, you're talking about, uh, Václav Benda called parallel police. Uh, it's the same thing you want to do. I said, okay. I've never heard about it, but I will write it down because it sounds really cool. So we started to, uh, we, we, we took this word, uh, these two words, and we started to study what's behind. And we realized that we know all the context, but this small word, the, the particular phase, uh, parallel police, remained just in, in uh, some texts uh, from, from the past, from communist regime, from 70s, as you will see. Uh, and it, it remained partially forgotten. So Peropolis, until 2014, wasn't some hyped word that everybody knows, but exactly the opposite. Like, only a few historians and few political scientists knew the word, the term Peropolis. So we, realized, so we um, uh, decided to take it up and give it a new life. Um, as we were diving into, into the term, um, it was uh, interest, in, interesting and important to understand 
uh, where, where the term comes from, and especially for those of you who are not into mid-Europe uh, um, history, it's very important to understand at least the very basics how the, the environment and the era uh, where the Parapolis comes from looked like and how it developed. So we are, uh, we are in deep 70s when we talk about Parapolis, and uh, at this time, you can see it was, uh, it was deep communism here, which started in 1948 with very brutal uh, change, uh, which was very, very unexpected, and it was a big lesson, because after the Second World War, everybody saw that this animal stuff and terror and brutals that happened during the Second World War will not happen again. And huh? 48 and 49, and it was here again, and in a very, very sharp way. Uh, the communists achieved during one or two years to, to spread the fear and, and orders so effectively that, that uh, they, they simply smashed all opposition all, or uh, other voices and, and uh, uh, established really tough uh, totalitarian regime. Uh, then in 1958, uh, you probably know about Khrushchev and his critics of Stalinism and so on, so, so the situation stabilized a little bit and, and the environment became a little, little bit more liberal and, uh, and, and breathable. Then a very important uh, part was the Prague Spring, 67 and 68, which was an era uh, of very high level of liberty, and very uh, optimistic social atmosphere, when especially art, uh, literature, uh, but also many other professions could uh, suddenly express themselves much freer than it was uh, used before. And to this situation, without any warning, uh, in '68 there was this uh, direct invasion of uh, USSR armies, you probably know about, uh, which, uh, which was like a punch from the Soviet Union that nobody expected. And to this peaceful and liberal environment suddenly came the Soviet tanks and started to, um, uh, started to shut to public buildings like a National Museum and so on. So, for, for the witnesses, uh, as I was interviewing uh, during, uh, during my program, uh, Police 100, uh, uh, that was exactly about this era, uh, they, they told me that, that they were totally shocked by what was happening, even though they already had the experience of the communist regime before. Uh, then from the 1968 and 80s, uh, after the occupation, there came so-called normalization. It was a very tough wave of uh, totalitarian practices, which we will be going to, uh, to talk about. And in the 80s, there uh, started some stagnation. The regime started to be more in defense than in offense. Uh, and uh, the structure started to uh, simply disintegrate and... Uh, and uh, um, and so on. So, when we talk about Parapolis and when it happened, so we talk about this era, this 70s, after the USSR army occupation. So, we call this era normalization. So, what, what, what happened? Um, in 68, the, the tanks came, the, the, the armies, and after that, there were a couple of individual uh, acts of protest. One of the most uh, uh, pop, uh, famous is, uh, uh, is self-burning of Jan Palach and his followers, which was a very strong act of protest, but, uh, but the regime succeeded in spreading fear and, and uh, simply uh, discouraged the opposition to uh, act somehow in, in a unified way and, and in some structured way. So only very few individual activities of some protest, dissent, and so on remained. 
One of them was so-called, and one of the most powerful in Czech, Czechoslovakia was so-called second culture, which was represented mostly by folk, underground, and other um, uh, musicians. Uh, and then some theaters and so on. You probably know the story of Václav Havel, etc. So you can, you can see. Uh, then uh, lots of uh, intellectual elites uh, were fired from universities and um, uh, Scientological uh, works, workplaces and so on and they lose their job uh, Lost their job and had to find something else to do. Usually it was some uh, workers uh, like second-class kind of the work like manual work and so on and uh, the only way they could continue their work was to, to go to underground. Uh, so they started to create so-called apartment universities and small groups where they uh, continued with uh, uh, teaching and uh, doing publication activities and so on. Uh, what's also interesting is uh, that very Im important role played the Christians, Christians groups and, and churches, uh, which is not frequently mentioned. And then in uh, 1977, uh, the, the one of the most significant acts of, uh, of resistance was so-called Charter 77, uh, which was a, like um, uh, uh, part or, or some result of growing influence of, of different small movements and individuals who started to be more and more uh, discomfort, but also encourage, encouraged uh, due to the regime practices. So what is interesting and important also is to see that uh, the, the Czechoslovak context is very different from other uh, Soviet uh, countries, uh, even in the European bloc. So when you, when you search for other dissident movements in other countries, you see very different strategies that have been taken. Uh, one of the most powerful uh, dissident movement was, uh, uh, was, was established in Poland, uh, where uh, in the 80s, um, Lech Walesa and his fellows kind of hacked uh, the system in a very uh, interesting way. Because what they did was not an unofficial movement, but they, they found in the constitution that workers had, have right to create unions, unions of workers, and these, these unions have uh, a right to, to uh, partial independence and sovereignty and self-governance. So they claimed, uh, they claimed this, uh, these rights, and as they were workers' movement, which was the basic vehicle for, for, for socialism, they, they kind of hacked the system because they achieved uh, that the government and the, and the Kurds had to admit that they have this right and they, they have this sovereignty and they, they can continue to work. And in 1981, they already had 10, millions, um, 10 million subscribers because as, as it was workers' union, they could suddenly spread around Poland uh, in many different cities and, and um, uh, uh, whatever, whatever kind of organizations that had more workers. And, uh, and that's why they were, uh, in a mass way, very, very successful and very influential. In Hungary, when I take another uh, example, uh, the, the opposition or, or, the, or the protest movement were more like uh, relevant political opposition. They, they, they were more like reformists who wanted to discuss with the system and, and push to change to change the system. So it was more like political, political way of, uh, of changing things. Another example is, uh, for, is Slovakia, where, uh, where the dissident movements uh, were very small, like in, in comparison especially to Poland, but even with, with uh, Czech Republic, but uh, they, they had different nature. For example, 
environmental uh, protecting groups or, ch or churches or, or individuals uh, who, who operated in, in different spots in, in Slovakia. So, so we have to uh, understand that, that uh, the context of these parallel policies, if, if, we, if we use a very wide uh, term, uh, differed country to country and culture to culture, let's say. But now we are going to talk about Charter 77 because there is a direct link between the term parallel police and Charter 77 that I will uh, explain you, to you. So uh, what, what was Charter 77? It was uh, uh, basically a petition of, uh, of so-called civil society uh, that just wanted uh, an appeal to government to keep the rules that they, uh, they accepted uh, via international treaties that, that, uh, uh, that contain norms uh, to, uh, related to human rights. Uh, it was signed in Helsinki in, in 70s, uh, but immediately the regime started to like, interrupt and not to, not to keep the rules. Uh, so, so Charter 77 was an appeal that wanted to be legal and uh, direct dialogue with the, with the government and applied to, appealed to, to comply with their human rights uh, rules. Uh, here you can see some, uh, some quotes. So you see the narrative and, uh, and examples of the text. Uh, so it was, it was really like, uh, fr from, from, from our perspective, it, it was nothing, nothing very uh, aggressive, because they just asked to keep the rules the state <laughs> already accepted. But uh, in this time, it was really very, uh, very brave act, uh, which, which the regime uh, took really, really, really bad. Uh, how, how the Charter 77 uh, uh, worked? So it was a text elaborated by a collective of authors that uh, wanted to remain uh, anonymous, but uh, one, of, one of them were, uh, were Václav Havel, also Václav Benda, and others, uh, other, other important names of the Czech dissident movement. Uh, they, they insist on remaining unpolitical in, in terms that uh, Charter 77 unified different professions, different uh, political uh, thinking, different, different currents of, of thought, and so on. So, so they wanted to unify all the streams of, of uh, protests and, and opposition movements uh, together. Uh, they didn't achieve that much uh, mass influence. Finally, it had like 1,200 1, 1, signers uh, until the end of communism. So it remained a very small, uh, very small initiative. But the reaction of the regime shows that it, it, was, it was like a hit to the black uh, middle point because, uh, because the, the regime reacted really, really um, in, a, in a strong way. So all the protagonists afterwards were, were uh, quite brutally chased and interrogated and, and still, under, uh, uh, still under surveillance, criminalized. Uh, lots of them uh, remained uh, or ended up in, in jail, finally. Um, so what was the reaction? Uh, Václav Benda describes uh, the ways of reaction uh, in, in, a, in a small article from uh, 1968, where he summarized up a very interesting uh, point. Uh, and it was that the, the regime had set of strategies that they repeatedly uh, changed. They, they, uh, they still use the same. They only changed that this time we are going to. Uh, create some anti-campaign. One of the examples is so-called anti-charter, which was a text that was refusing uh, the Charter 77 
uh, requirements and, and appeals. And they, they uh, asked all the uh, Czechoslovak elite, uh, especially artists and, and uh, teachers from uh, professors and so on and so on, to, to, uh, to sign it. Uh, so so they, they've created a very strong uh, media pressure based on uh, defamation. You could read that uh, the Charter 77's uh, um, uh, uh, representants were, were uh, like junkies who, who took drugs and poisoned wells and uh, were founded by by imperialists from US and so on and so on. So really, really like, uh, so if we, if we talk about fake news today, it was nothing in comparison to fake news generated by, by the uh, communist regime at this time. Another, another way was uh, bureaucratic persecution. So whatever you wanted to do and you needed some approval for it, you didn't get it. You couldn't travel, you couldn't study, you couldn't whatever. You were still in some clash with administration. Uh, another, another way was police repression. So everybody from the movement knew that they have their own police officer. They knew that uh, the, the power tries to persuade other people to cooperate with them and become agents, so they knew that there are probably are infiltrated agents among them, and they will they were totally without any reasoning suddenly arrested, interrogated for a couple of hours, and then they let them go and and they did it repeatedly all the time, so you never knew if you come back home or not uh, any day another Another way was that they created uh, criminal trials, usually construct from constructed uh, reasons and background, and uh, then they imprisoned the, the actors uh, based on these, these constructed accusations. Uh, and in general, they, they spread fear and uh, intimidation. So this was how they reacted. And now we are going to uh, come to the, to the Parapolis term, where it comes from. So the author uh, of the term is Václav Benda, uh, uh, who was a politician. He lived here in Prague. I, I sat at the table where the Charter 77 was written. His wife, is, uh, Kamila Bendova, is still alive. So we interviewed her uh, a couple of times, and it was really interesting to see, because at their family table, a very part, very big part of uh, Czech history happened, and one one of them was uh, the, the the Charter 77 was written there. Uh, so so he was kind of a key person uh, in the movement. Uh, he was mathematician and philosopher, and all his interests can be covered with this triangle, if you use the Parapolis symbolics which was Catholicism, politics, and philosophy. So these were t three top topics of uh, Václav Benda, which tells you that he was a deeply believing Catholic uh, who, who uh, always imprinted his uh, Christianity to his texts, uh, to his philosophy, and so on. Uh, and uh, what what Benda openly was, was also he, he wanted to be the kind of a, a kind of a leader of the movement. Um, uh, he also hoped that uh, if the regime fails, uh, fails one day, which he really believed in, uh, and there, there was not many, there were not many people who really believed that the, that the regime will fail, but he was one of them, and. He hoped that he will be the Václav, but, but not the Havel, who finally became, became the political leader. But he wanted to be the Václav Havel, he, uh, which he finally didn't, uh, didn't become. And one of the reasons probably is that uh, in country where is the highest rate of non-believers uh, uh, and atheists, it's, it's uh, quite difficult to become a leader with a with, uh, Catholic program. 
Um, so now, uh, where, where, uh, how it happened? Um, uh, Václav Benda, uh, in 1978, started to realize that uh, behind Charter 77 movement, there are some patterns uh, of, of the behavior of the movement that show uh, us some, some, some interesting phenomena. And the phenomena is that uh, as, as, a, uh, as an act of uh, self-protection and survival in, in, the, in the environment of the oppression, they had to start to behave in a different way and take different tactics. And uh, Václav Benda was describing the tactics, the strategies, and he covered those strategies with the name of Pearl Polis. So what is Pearl Polis, according to Benda, is a set of strategies that the movement take, took to protect against the, uh, against the totality and uh, to, to create an environment that is not in clash, in direct clash with the government, but uh, creates own, its own uh, social structures that work beside the official one. And uh, it's also interesting to see uh, the two words, to take a look at them. So first, polis, uh, what does it mean? Because uh, very frequently people think like, is it police, like, like the, the state police, so you're joking of Fritz or, or, or what? No, it's it's a polis in the old uh, Greek ter uh, the po old Greek term that refers to uh, ancient polis, so-called city-state. It's the but, like most frequent uh, term you 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 realized. But uh, but of course the polis also developed. It uh, it appeared around 800 before Christ. Uh, as, as the population of Greece grew, uh, so uh, there started to, to appear uh, more and more polis, uh, these city-states, which created some basic organizational structure of the society. So polis is basically a uh, basic social structure, we, we might say also community, so the basic unit of, 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 the, of the society. Uh, what is also important there is, is, the, is the personal identification with the polis. So I am the part of the polis, where in the Greek times, uh, originally there were tribes, but, uh, but what happened was that with the, with the rise of uh, polis, uh, the tribe system uh, was changed into the identification with the, with the polis more than with the tribes. And uh, what, what was the primary uh, visible uh, character of police was that every police has, had his, its own army, its own laws, and its own set of gods. Uh, then the word parallel is also, also interesting to take a look at the etymology, because uh, very frequently people think that it's something alternative, something, something derived from uh, from the main thing, so we, we take the official main thing and we just create some fork of it or so. But parallel uh, doesn't mean alternative. It means, uh, it's also from Greek, it's a para, means alongside something, something, something out of, I would say. And aleos, aleos uh, is one another, so, so we see the, differ the, the total differentiate uh, like of the subjects. So it's, it's always something totally separate. Uh, it's also interesting to see in other, uh, other uh, definitions of parallel, which is never meeting, however far extended, uh, uh, but have the same direction. So this is, this is uh, the term parallel polis. And when we come back to Václav Benda, so what, what were the main pillars or the principles of Paropolis according to uh, Václav Benda? So the, uh, basically what it is, is uh, creating of autonomous social and other structures 
that are independent and beside, work beside the official regime or other authorities. Uh, he also named some, um, um, some parts of, or some pillars of the parallel police that, that were uh, characteristic for the uh, Charter 77 movement. One of, uh, the, one of the most important were the, the parallel education, then of course parallel economy, parallel culture, the second culture. Uh, uh, then it was the principle of active civil rights protection. They had their own information system uh, called Samizdat, which was like uh, organically, uh, or we could say peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, spreading of uh, publications and, and other information. And they claimed to have sovereign international relationships uh, also uh, foreign policy, we might say. Uh, so these were, these were those that uh, were characteristic for Charter 77, but what is important, and, and uh, Benda, Benda expressly says it in the, in the essay, is that these are only some examples, and there is not any limit or, or some rule why Paropolis couldn't do uh, many other uh, other things and operate on other fields. So it's usually, it's always depends on the circumstances, environment, era, culture, and so on, what, uh, what the parallel police in this exact condition is. As if you remember the, uh, the, uh, the examples from other countries, so the parallel police in, Hung in Hungary was totally different to Paropolis in Czechoslovakia, was totally different to Paropolis in Slovan, uh, in Poland, sorry. And uh, later, as the, as the term was discussed within the dissident movement, uh, uh, the other authors like Václav Havel, uh, Šimečka and others uh, elaborated um, uh, some, some idea what is the goal of Paropolis, because otherwise it was just a description of, of strategy, like, for example, crypto-anarchy is. But they, they, they articulated the goal of Paropolis, which is independent society. And it sounds very general. So what does it mean? And I, I, I love the most the Václav Havel definition, uh, which is uh, very idealistic, but it says that uh, independent society means that wherever the civil society can organize itself, the, the state should make the step back. Like, okay, you are able to organize by yourself. I give up my rules and my authority and leave it up to you. So the ideal state, uh, co-living with Paropolis, would always make the step back when the self-organization uh, is able to govern uh, our own things. Uh, without the state authority. Um, so now maybe it's a good question to ask, so what can be Parapolis? Is it only the house in Holeshovice or in Vienna or in Bratislava as it used to be? Or what, what can be, what all can be Parapolis? And uh, not a long time ago, we had a very interesting interview with Muggler and Frank Brown on their podcast with Stream cypherpunk, and uh, we discussed there that Parapolis probably is just some expression of something that is uh, deeply in our human gene, in our human nature, uh, because when we apply the principles of Parapolis back to the his historical, uh, historical facts, we can see that in, in history many times, uh, wherever, whenever the state power grew too much, there were created some kind of parallel structures. And that's why I placed here this image that I really like. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an image from the ancient Rome. This, this uh, up on the ground is, is the Rome Empire and the, and the governance uh, by, by the Rome Empire. And here, under the ground, are the catacombs uh, that, uh, that you can visit, especially in Rome, uh, which were occupied by the first Christians after, 
uh, after the uh, uh, B, uh, BC, <laughs> simply. Uh, uh, and uh, as, as you probably remember from history, uh, the first Christians during the first three centuries after Christ were, were uh, illegal and chased and haunted by the, uh, by the Rome imperial power. So they had to operate totally illegally. And their strategy was that they dig into the ground and created und uh, like truly underground uh, cities or catacombs, it's, it's, uh, it's called. So even, even back in history, two, 2,000 uh, years ago, we can see some expressions of, of need, in this case, to, uh, to freely express my re religious uh, preferences. And it can, of course, also be uh, something that will happen in future. I, I chose an example of, uh, of uh, Parapolis 3.0, which is a concept described by Yurei Bednar, who is having parallel uh, talk right now. <laughs> Uh, and I, I recommend to read it if you haven't. It's on the website of uh, Slovak Parapolis Parallelna And it's, it's, it's an idea how a Parapolis uh, concept could develop for future not to be dependent on physical space, physical premises. So he proposes kind of a fluid structure, which anyways uh, anyway, is happening as, as other parapolis and in different forms are growing, uh, not only in Czech Republic. So uh, this this is uh, this is some final thought, thought that I would like to propose, and uh, I, I would like you to think about uh, and learn from history, because maybe some form of parapolis is some kind of anthropological constant, something that is uh, common for all humans, all human beings. And we can see throughout history that, that uh, some forms of parapolis happen. And we can learn from the strategies. We can see uh, even now in the world, in, uh, when, we, when we take a look to different regimes, that, that things are happening there. Uh, when you take a look to North Korea, you can see that th there are youth uh, smuggling uh, into this North Korea uh, uh, culture, especially from South Korea, but uh, from, from other countries as well. And uh, even though the region did a really, really good job in uh, brainwashing the people, they didn't succeed. Some, some, some basic need or freedom remained even in this North Korean regime. And some versions of Parapolis we probably don't know about now uh, are happening there as well. So uh, it's my call to, to study history and uh, search for Parapolises and the principles and the inspiration for this. So I would like to end up with this, with what, what I've uh, what I've started with, and it's the moment when uh, I was talking to my friend about crypto technologies, Bitcoin, decentralization, and so on. And he, as political think, uh, political scientist, realized the connection, some some relation to the to the historical point from 70s to, to Parapolis, to the concept. Uh, and, and he proposed that. And for me, this is a very interesting moment because it connects some, some very small piece of our history with uh, something that is happening now, and which was the very grain and seed uh, of, of this concept we are uh, participating on now. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? Raise your hand, please. Uh, could you please tell uh, a bit more about uh, the future, um, the visions uh, for Parallel Police? Uh, 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 that's a very good question. 
because uh, recently Parallel Police is going through very dramatic changes. You probably saw that uh, Slovak Parallel Police has closed down. Uh, it was not uh, feasible to to keep the premise they they they, they found. Uh, Bratislava, Slovakia. Uh, th there was parallel police for two years or three years. Um, another parallel police was established last year in Vienna, operates totally independently in a very nice way. And there are other groups uh, like in Košice and uh, in, in many other places that somehow want to uh, deal with this, what, what we've done here and uh, continue with it and follow it up. But even even this this project this this like first police I would call it uh, uh, goes through changes uh, which which are organizational which are related of course to to uh, need to create different model different business model for for operations such of such a big house and there is also this concept of Parapolis 3.0 like a new new version that wouldn't be uh, that much bind to, to physical premises, to some like institution in the physical way, but uh, could, could provide us some tools to, to, uh, to cooperate and, and work together in another way, which I think is very important for the future because what is happening in the world now, and it's the topic of this Congress, is uh, that accidentally the situation can get much worse and even keeping the physical space might be too big obstacle due to some oppression, repression, whatever, uh, from the side of the state. And uh, we have to be ready for a moment when we won't, have, won't be able to operate the physical space. Charter 77 also didn't have their own coffee and co-working and, and so on because it wouldn't be possible simply. And we have to get ready for, for a moment when, when it won't be possible to operate in a, this nice way anymore. And I think the concept of Parapolis 3.0 is exactly the, the, the way, the direction uh, that, that is interesting to, to take, to talk about. Um, <clears throat> have you thought about... Um trying to reach some billionaire, um, like some, some billionaire. Um, billionaire? Yeah, like Peter Thiel uh, uh, and, and um, um, or some foundation, I mean, which um, uh, could theoretically, I mean, more easily um, add funds and uh, help. I think th these principles are set from the very beginning uh, very clearly. Uh, there are different kinds of memberships in Parapolis, uh, and one of them is so-called Board of Donors. That's the highest uh, way of, uh, of, uh, of member membership, or not the highest, but the most generous, I would say. And uh, these people pay uh, quite significant amount p uh, per month. I think it's like 700 euros, 600 euros, something like this, per month. Uh, but the point is that nobody can pay more. They, they, they have like uh, strictly done, uh, set, set up the, the fee, the, the membership fee they pay. So, uh, which, which should protect the organization from one general partner who will donate us lots of money one year. So, so the organization starts to operate with different budget. And another year they, he can say, ah, if you don't do this thing that I like, I will stop my funding, which can be fatal for the organization. So, so that's, that's the principle how we reach the money of, let's say, more wealthy people. <laughs> but, uh, but of course, it's living organism and things can change in future. I don't uh, exclude it. Yeah, sorry, there, there's another question, so we can back, get back to you. <laughs> if there are no any others. Uh, so at this moment, would you say that parallel New Polish community is more uh, has more of a physical presence or online presence? If you should compare it, uh, it definitely was more about physical presence, and I think that uh, during the last year, it takes serious, important lesson 
that uh, being uh, dependent on the physical presence only is not the good way. So I think now this Congress is exactly a good, good uh, example how, how the things evolve, how the thing evolves. And, uh, um, and I, um, I can't imagine that, that it would come back uh, to physical premises only presence. Uh, I think the, the, the online would be more and more important, of course. Any other questions? Just to add on, on the idea I mentioned before about the billionaires, because I, I think that um, there are many people, some people or many many people in the in the crypto space, uh, which um, made a lot of money with um, rising crypto prices. Some didn't. I mean, some even had um, losses because of unfortunate um, things like uh, MT Gox and etc. Um, but um, I recently saw some article also that the, the number of, of Bitcoin uh, billionaires is, or, um, is, or um, multimillionaires is, is like again rising very much. And so um, maybe um, we have uh, through networking we can reach to such people. And maybe if um, for one time because of Corona also. Um, you could set a, a clear rule like, okay, this time we will accept larger donations, um, but um, with absolutely no interference, of course, in the, the operations. But because um, I think that at least a part of these um, very rich people now, um, um, they, um, if, if we um, made them become very aware that they only did uh, um, get this, this money because of um, Satoshi and, and all the others who contributed, um, then um, I think it, this is such a great place and um, um, such many great things come out of here so that... Uh, um, this it, is it's very nice to hear. Of yeah. course, uh, donations are always nice. But what which, which is uh, much more valuable and sustainable is uh, when, the, when the organization is able to create the fundings itself. So, so I think this, this should be still the main focus, how to be totally independent on donations. And then donations can be the nice to have uh, add-on or, or some network that, that uh, protects you from total fall in case of some critical situations, uh, then some donator who helps not to fall to the ground can be, of course, uh, important. And in other parallel policies in history, of course, it was uh, uh, very, very important as well. Uh, the, the frequently, uh, uh, frequently uh, quoted Soros, so, uh, Soros, the, this this uh, big. Uh, donor, uh, one of the biggest in the world, uh, also supported Charter 77 uh, in the 70s and 80s. So, so yeah, we can see lots of parallels uh, with history as well. But not, not parallel policy. He didn't fund parallel policy, uh, as far as I know. There is one more question. Okay, last question. Appreciate. Um, this year, there's the the online version and the physical version, and also in previous years, I'm sure you recorded a lot of the the content. So now it's kind of it's not just like a physical thing because it's um, people are experiencing in real time uh, anywhere. Um, and we just spoke about um, mo like a sustainable way of surviving, like in a material sense. What's your um, plan or vision for you know this content or the stuff that's being generated? Um, like, does does that relate in some way to um, to sustainable way of like, for example, you could have like a library of content that you pay to access, or like there's this um, now that you have the the valuable stuff in 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 this form, and and you're open to uh, you know, opening it to the world, you don't have to be here. Like, how, how do these two relate, or do they relate in your vision? Uh, 
I'm not the person in charge for this. Uh, because, uh, I, I am since since May. I'm not member of of the of the leadership of this organization. Uh, uh, so it's not in my hands anymore. But uh, as far as I know, uh, the Slovak model will be followed. So Slovak parallel police create a paid zone for for uh, courses and and lectures and so on that happened in Parapolis physically so you you cannot access all the content for free but there is some paid zone and i think this makes sense because uh, it worked pretty well uh, in slovakia uh, so so i think this this should be followed um uh, as well, and, and, the, and the user experience with the hop-in, with the tool for, the, for, the, for this Congress is, is quite nice. I'm positively surprised how, how, how nice it works. So I, I think that's, that's exactly the way how to do stuff, yeah. <laughs>